I'm here with Professor Lawrence Baker from Stanford Medical School, and I'm hoping he can at least start to get me to understand something that I've always worried, wondered about and, and worried about a little bit. Let's say that I'm, I'm some drug company, so let me write this down. So like I'm, I'm some pharma company, pharma, pharma company A right over here. And let's say that I, I don't know, I invest, I invest 10 years and $100 million in, in, in some drug. I get it through all of the clinical trials and it gets approved by the FDA. And it is, and let's say just for sake of simplicity, it cures it cures, it cures disease, it cures disease X. Now, once I get to that point, I'm feeling pretty good about myself I'm as the pharma company. What happens next? I mean, I'm assuming that I'm going to have to go to the insurance companies and, and maybe Medicaid and Medicare and, and figure out how much they're going to pay for it. But, but how does that conversation even happen? Yeah, so you're going to have a conversation with a bunch of different uh, folks. So in the U.S., we have lots of different private insurance mm -hmm. plans. We got government plans. And you're actually going to have conversations with Europe and with some of the other systems around the world because each system is going to make its own And they have decision. a different way of doing it. Uh, they may not. They, they have, have some negotiate. similarities in the way that they probably want to talk to you about Does there it, tend to be a lead system? Does it tend to be either the Europeans or does it tend to be the private insurers in the U.S.? Or do you start all of those conversations at once because there's so much money on the table? So there will be some st strategy your business is going to come to because it's very hard to have all these conversations exactly simultaneously. Right. So you'll talk to the U.S., you talk to Europe. And some there are some cases in which people have viewed the regulatory processes in Europe as a little easier for some things, so they may want to st start in Europe. But in other cases, if you're looking at a drug that, maybe some of the national systems in Europe are less likely to want to pay for, you might start with right. the U.S. where there's a little more flexibility. And, and But the general rule of thumb is all the money is in Europe and the U.S. mainly right now. A lot of it's there. The Asian systems, and uh, some of them are uh, pretty sophisticated and, and using a lot of the advanced drugs too, but I think the majority of the money is in the U.S. And right. And between Europe North and the America, U.S., I, I guess I've always imagined it was a lot, North America was, was maybe the, where the bulk of the money was, but is, is that the case? The U.S., um, well, our, our healthcare system spends more than everybody in the world, and it's true for drugs too. We spend more on drugs here than okay. most other places. So definitely if I'm here, pharma company A, I mean, I, I, I want to make sure I get this right in the U.S., yeah, eventually you probably I mean, care a lot about Part of my investment that I've made is based on some understanding that I'm, I, if, if I got all the way through, that I would get some type of return within the U.S. So, so let's say I go, to, I go to the, it, will I necessarily go to, immediately go to Medicare because they're one of the largest players? Or will I go to, like we talked about, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or Kaiser, or some of these other players? Um, so you, you probably, Medicare is actually kind of an interesting one for drug mm. prices because historically Medicare has not been a big uh, cover and still isn't of a lot of the the drugs that you hear about. So Medicare does not pay um, by itself for outpatient drugs, drugs that you might take at home. Really? No, Medicare, I always assume that they, they don't. They don't. So Medicare in its main pieces, Medicare we right. call Part A, Part right. B, Part C, um, well, so Part A and Part B, let's go start there, they tend not to cover or they don't cover outpatient drugs. If you get a drug in the hospital while you're, while you're hospitalized, Medicare will pay for those. And so if you got a drug that's going to be primarily used in that uh, setting, you're going to talk to Medicare about it, and that's going to be an important piece of the conversation. But if you're talking about an outpatient drug, uh, you're talking to many uh, And when we say entities. outpatient, I mean inpatient is you're in the hospital, you're sick, you need, I don't know, morphine right now. That's inpatient drug. Yeah. Outpatient is, hey, you're going back home, take this three times a day. Yeah, somebody sends you to the pharmacy to pick up the prescription and you right. take it home with you, that's going to be an outpatient kind right. of drug. So Medicare uh, doesn't cover that in its main Part A and Part B. There's mm -hmm. Medicare Part D, which is an, a drug plan in Medicare. Uh, and that will cover a lot of the outpatient drugs. And so there you have conversations with with them. But most of the Medicare Part D plans are essentially private companies uh, that Medicare contracts with. So you're not really talking to the government at that point. You're talking to these private plans that have contracted with Medicare to be I Part see. D care. So, so once again, going back to the, the crux of the question of how are these drugs going to get paid for? How are we going to determine the price at which these drugs get paid for? It goes straight. It goes back to the private plans again because they're going to contract. Their Part D is going to say, "Oh, you're Medicare Part D. We're going to go to we're going to go to Aetna. We're going to go to some Somebody. other plan or whoever it might be. I don't know who it whoever's might be. offering those Part D whoever's plans, offering yeah. those Part D plans. And so it'll be it'll kind of ride off of whatever that private party has already negotiated with the pharma company. It'd be related, probably. Okay, so, so let's say let's say I go to let's say that so we have some type of insurance. Let's call this insurance. I'm running out of letters now. Let's call this insurance company, insurance company Y right over here. Mm -hmm. And I go have a conversation with insurance company Y, and I was like, "Hey, this is a big deal. You know, disease X. You know, it's 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 been killing people. I want one million dollars per pill." 
Yeah, and so those have been really interesting conversations in the U.S. So there's some uh, bargaining back and forth yeah. between the insurance company and the drug maker. The drug maker is going to have spent a lot of money. You've got a hundred million up there. Yes. In most cases, the I deserve to make at least ten billion dollars off. Of it. You, well, so there's <laughs> yes. a certain a certain that's, amount, that's, certain that's extent. It's called to which anchoring that's, in a negotiation. Right, Anchor. <laughs> right. You start with what you think you can. Yes. Get, yes. You true, a yeah. Number to get everybody's mind around. It. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in reality, it costs well over $100 million to take a drug through the trials, to the, do yeah. the development work and stuff. So they're going to be sitting there with a the number, at least internally, saying, we want to get our $800 million, our $1.5 right. billion back from this. And so we're going to Because try it's and not just it the cost of that one drug. Is that you, so? What is the cost? Do you, you know off the top of your mind? Oh, it's, it's uh, hundreds of millions. Just so there's the development costs that go yeah. in that the pharma companies aren't typically willing to talk a lot about. Right. And then there's the cost of getting through the trials and the yeah. FDA approvals, which people say uh, you know 500 million and up. They'll say higher numbers for, for, sometimes for one for one given drug. Yeah. 500 million. So so it can be as high as 500 million. It can be higher. Can be greater than 500 500 million. And so that doesn't even take into the kind of the probability weighted risk. That there's a ten percent chance that it fails, or, or a ten right. percent chance that it works. Right. So it, it's really if if you're spending a hundred million per drug, and only one out of ten of those drugs are going to get to the to the end zone. Yeah, you'll see you're along actually the way. Spending, oh, I mean, you I won't see. spend the whole wide and then find out. You'll yeah. find out in steps. I see. So right. You'll so have you'll to stop. spend something to get there. So so even though this on one drug it might be a hundred million or five hundred million, they might have spent another three hundred or four hundred million on drugs that didn't go anywhere. Plus their own development costs. In plus, the plus their own development know, costs. So the, so if you if you try to kind of fully load the costs, it's it, it, it's a it's a large number. It's a large number. Yeah. Number. So they're they're running a right exactly. They're running a operation where they got to put a lot of money in up front. When they get a success, they have to get enough out of that one success to pay for the operation right. to kind of keep things going for the right. next development round. So right. they're looking at those kinds of numbers, and they're trying to figure out in this negotiation what they can sell this for. And that's a back-and-forth uh, discussion. The insurance companies have some ability to you know, say what they're willing to pay, but um, a lot of these drugs, if they're doing a cure in a disease yeah. that people care about, the, the pharma companies have a lot of... Uh, of ability to come and say this is what we need to get for this and set that price and be able to get it for a while. So who has, I mean obviously the pharma company is coming here with all of this investment, they definitely want it to get covered, but the insurance company, I guess their incentive is they don't want to look like all of a sudden this this company that doesn't provide a you know the cure for disease X. I, I mean do, do insurance companies ever walk away and say well you know that's just too much. I, I understand you invested all this money but we just can't do that. That's just crazy. So the US, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. The U.S. doesn't have a lot of cases where insurance companies have really put their foot down and said, no, they're not going to do anything. Yeah. They're not going to yeah. have anything to do with some uh, new drug that comes out. And some of that's the fact, the, the due to the existence of lots of different companies. So, right. you know, if, you, if five of the companies say no, but the next guy in line says yes, then yeah. the, the dynamic of that in a competitive market is often that everybody else will eventually come around and say, right. okay, you know, someone's going to do it. something. They might not, they not, might not pay for it outright. But that's why, you know, I guess the whole reason why we're having this conversation is because there are some drugs that are you know seem like reasonably priced to me but there's some that are like thirty thousand dollars a pill or something I, I made up that number but yeah so if you so the cases the really expensive ones are drugs that are uh, unique uh, tend to be unique at least right. to some extent cure a disease that gets some high profile so people yeah. are worried that they're going to die if they right. don't get this drug uh, and of course they're still on patent that's another feature of all right, this right, right. you right. get this we get the high price for a certain period of time until your yeah. patents and, run out and then the generic um, and then generic comes in and the price the cost of the pill which is it's, it drops pennies or dollars right right, right. Um, so you know how you get these things set in a competitive market is an interesting question one of the things that happens um, it, one of the things that gets the brand name drugs to be a little cheaper is competition within the class. So if there's right. two or three drug manufacturers right. who have something that'll basically do the same thing, that'll tend to take the edge off the right. thirty thousand a pill kind of situation and get you down reasonable, yeah. uh, more reasonable prices. It won't get you all the way to generic right. pricing. But it just seems yeah. to me. I mean, you just mentioned that very few insurance companies have ever walked away from this. If if you ever have a negotiation, you know, buying a used car, whatever, where where one of the two parties is not walking away, then it doesn't seem like there's actually a hard, a serious negotiation. I, I, am I getting that wrong, or is yeah, so you know, I th I got I don't know all the ins and outs of all these right, right, right. There's lots that goes on in these things, but I think that one of the things that people would say about the U.S. is that when a manufacturer, drug manufacturer, comes up with a fairly unique, on patent drug that does some tangible good, that they more or less can set the price that they want to get for it, and they're going to make some calculation because they could set a high enough price that everybody would say forget it. So they're right. going to try and figure out something. Right. But they're trying to get as much as they can, and they get a, a, some leeway for at least a period of time to. So name they'll that get price. leeway, and I guess there's some range of of reasonableness 
where it's like, okay, yes, you're, you know, you've done something amazing for humanity. You, you're going to get a, you know, a 35% return on your investment, but that shouldn't be a 300% return on your investment. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know at what point the U.S. would ever walk or the private insurers yeah. so we don't would know. ever walk from this. I, I haven't seen it really happen, and I think drug companies are pretty sophisticated about trying to figure out what price they think they can make work and get that as high as they can get that. Yeah, so I guess I'm still back where it's still unclear to see who, who, who's kind of making out here really well. You know, this has been a really interesting debate. You know, pharma companies put huge amounts of money into these drugs, and once in a while they do some really useful things and they get high premiums. There are other people who argue that some of the things that they're getting high premiums for, you know, aren't really valuable enough, or somehow we've been told we need a drug that if we had it to our own devices, we would never come up with the fact that we need it. And so, you know, what's the real value at the end of the day? And I think that's one of the debates we're going to have in this country for a little while. The, the industry has been coming up with new things, and they're going to keep trying to do right. that. Um, we want to, from a social standpoint, from a policy standpoint, try to make sure that things we're doing are really valuable to society and not copies of other drugs or not inventing a disease that didn't need a solution and then solving the problem. And sometimes right. we worry that maybe we're getting some of that. And I think that's the challenge for the U.S. health insurance system, for the regulatory processes to try to guide the innovation and guide the purchasing of these things to really create the most value for society. It's been a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. We, we have the challenge because we have tremendous opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so your your gut created. sense there probably are some drugs out there that maybe we are that 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 the the that, that, that they're doing really well maybe it it uh, well above and beyond the investment cost but it's, it's hard to say it's on a, really on a case by case basis. Yeah, I don't think you'd want to make a generic a statement, statement right? about all the drugs that have been discovered. Some of the things that right. we've put out there in the last couple of decades are really important drugs right. that are going to do right. a lot of good and you know I think there are debates about some other ones where maybe right. somebody's been able to be clever about marketing and sell it right. and we're less sure that it's and that, really that actually bad. marketing not to make this conversation too long, mm -hmm. uh, but but you know some people bring up that the drug companies you know they they say look there's there's a lot of investment right over here on on this and so they have to get some reasonable return on it and, and that seems to make sense especially mm -hmm. when you probability weight it and all of that yeah but they spend a significant amount on marketing as well on actual marketing you watch the nightly news you're gonna, most of the ads you're going to see drug companies they do the physician dinners and they do all their things like that I mean th that seems to undermine that argument that all of the money is going for for R and D. I, I, right. If you just towed up the dollars, I'm not sure how uh, you'd actually what the numbers would come out right. like. And it's you know honestly, the farm farm companies aren't really excited about telling everybody all the right. details of right. their businesses for good reason. Right. Uh, so I so I'm it not seems sure, like but it's absolutely there's a huge amount of marketing. You spend a ton down. of money on the marketing, and then you get you know you get the consumer here to kind mm -hmm. of put the pressure on the insurance companies and the and the doctors to say, hey, you you, you better cover that, or or I'm right. asking for that, whatever it might. Right. Yeah, there was a time. Uh, you know, within my memory, where we weren't allowed to do uh, direct to consumer marketing, where the laws prohibited that, and the change came around, and now we're allowed yeah. to do it, and it's really changed the way that drugs are. I mean, marketed. I have found you, that weird because if these are drugs that are meant to be by prescription, and it should, so it's, which means that it should be a doctor's judgment on whether or not you should get the drugs. Why is it being advertised on the nightly news to a, a general audience? Right, right, a general audience who doesn't understand all the ins and outs of the drug and whose doctor. Right. May or may not want to take the time to but then explain. They, but then it all they'll to them. go exactly. But then they'll go to the doctor and say, "Please, please give me this drug." And then the doctor, it's easier for them to say, "Well, sure." Yeah, no, I think th I think a lot of doctors would express a certain amount of frustration about that. Their patients come in; it's hard to have the conversation in a short period of time, so it's easier just to give them the drug. Fascinating.